And we are live. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Let me make some adjustments to my sound here. And hopefully everybody can still hear me. Let's, uh, let's rock and roll here. Hold on a minute. We got one of these persistent programs that with an autoplay on it that uh, on my web browser that just will not quit autoplaying. It they want you to hear it. So uh, I apologize for that. We'll we'll get to that shortly. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, our show today. We uh, our our guest was not able to make it due to a pretty nasty bug he picked up. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, stuff that's in the news and and some informational uh, or uh, some educational offerings that are that are out there that that I went in and picked up for for the show here. So so we can talk about that. Uh, if you have any comments, uh, be sure to post them up. I'm monitoring both uh, uh, both LinkedIn and. Uh, and YouTube. So if you got any comments, you can post them or any questions. Uh, let me know. I'm, I'm always interested in, in hearing from from everybody if they got questions or comments on any of this stuff. It, it, uh, it helps the conversation a little bit. Um, <clears throat> it's a little awkward. I'm working on two computers here. So so I'm checking the comments on one and, and running this on another. So so we don't have any uh, <coughs> issues with the CPA load. So uh, so anyway, let's uh, <clears throat> Let's dive in here a little bit and and see what's going on. So uh, first off, I, I found this uh, online. This is this is really for for Arizona, but uh, um, what we uh, uh, but but I thought it would be useful for for everybody involved here is that uh, um, this is a, a webinar on free financial tools for owners, operators, managers of water systems. Uh, really looking at your revenues, if you've had, you know, been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, assessing financial performance, assessing and setting rates. So they cover a lot of stuff. And, and this is really good for, for small water districts. There may be some Arizona specific stuff in here, but I think it's, it's a, since it's a, a, a free webinar, it really is uh, probably worthwhile for for almost anybody to see if they can get some uh, some tips and tricks because uh, a lot of times small water districts don't have the financial training that that, that they might otherwise need and and get uh, you know certainly don't have the advantage of larger water districts so so stuff like this and and free information uh, can certainly be helpful uh, because. You know, the, the crunch of the numbers things is such an important part. Setting rates, making sure your rates cover all your costs, uh, budgeting for, for some of the things. Uh, you know, my business deals a lot with uh, with asset management and, and dealing with water wells and eventually replacing them and doing maintenance. And, and that's all stuff that, that should be budgeted for. So so it's, it's, it's really important to understand that process. Capital improvement programs are, are important as well. Do you have enough money there for when things break or planned replacement of assets as well? So, so whatever information you can get to improve your skills in that area is, is actually good. Um, the second one that came up, and this is, this is a, a Canadian webinar series, and this actually started yesterday, but it's going to run uh, through December 15th weekly on Wednesdays, and source water protection. And so, you know, once again, it's, it's uh, really, uh, you know, geared towards Canadians, but, but the principles, pretty, uh, source water protection doesn't change uh, Unless it's a little bit to do with the regulations, but but the principles don't really change whether you're in Canada or the U.S. or or uh, some other country. So so you can probably pick up a lot of good information there. Uh, as development continues in a lot of areas, we see that source water protection 
is really something that that uh, that people need to pay a lot of attention to because um, you, if if you have a well and a well is an expensive asset, I told you we deal a lot with asset management and and water wells and uh, protecting your groundwater sources is really vital because now you have contamination in your well uh, and it's a man-made contaminant source then uh, you know you're looking at some pretty fin uh, pretty big financial obligations legal actions things like that so so understanding the principles of source water protection if you have a groundwater system or or even surface water actually this applies to surface water as well then it's 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 really important to understand that so so once again this is this is a freebie and and certainly if you're interested in source water protection i would uh urge you to uh to to take advantage of this and uh <clears throat> i'm not seeing where it's restricted to people from canada or anything it's just all free so you can just uh pop on here and register you can see the information <clears throat> you can track that down um, it's the Okanagan uh, Water Basin or uh, Basin Water Boards um, uh, program here. So, SourceWaterProtectionToolkit.ca is is the the uh, the link there. <clears throat> All right. So, diving into some of the other current water news here, uh, I thought it might be appropriate, to, considering what's happening in the West is to bring up a copy of the U.S. Drought Monitor. And speaking of, of forums and, and, uh, and, and the like here, uh, um, the, U, uh, the, the link right up here at the top on the U.S. Drought Monitor is they're having a, a forum that's running today and tomorrow, and you can register uh, there at this page. Um, I, I think there's, there's a, an agenda up there as, as well. So uh, if you're interested in the effects of the drought and mitigating drought and, and what's to come, then that's really a good, good thing to maybe pop in and, and check out some of the sessions. So, but uh, here's our current situation. Um, we're probably seeing in Northern California, Southern Oregon, a little bit of relief uh, with some precipitation up there coming. And, um, but uh, we got La Nina conditions developing, and that's going to be warm and dry in the winter. So I don't expect that we're going to see any in the in the West any real relief from from these drought conditions. So we're probably going to be going into next year with this or, or worse. And and really the the color coding here, uh, if I can just show you down here, we can see is is the dark brown here is exceptional drought and the red is is extreme drought so we have a huge portion of of the western u.s that is in severe to uh okay um hold on a minute there's that persistent thing that keeps wanting to auto play they want to get their their uh their video running here so that's in another tab so so anyway um we don't expect any any real relief here so so if you're if you're in california for instance and relying on on water project water for for your ag uh, ag uh, operations then you're probably not going to see much uh, next year either so uh, so we're seeing a lot of acres being fallowed. We're seeing, and we got some stories we're going to talk about on, on this here too, because the, the drought of course is, is big news out, out West and, and there's, it's impacting a lot of people. So, um, so groundwater, a lot of people turning to groundwater, but groundwater, as we know, is a, is a finite resource. And so what, what, uh, what we're doing is we're putting more pressure on the groundwater with no with no precipitation and under drought conditions, now our recharge is not going on the way it should. So what we're doing is depleting our, our groundwater resources faster than they can be recharged. And so this, this uh, really implies long-term consequences here. Uh, the state of California's uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is, is kicking in, uh, albeit slowly. Uh, there's definitely some holes in that program. And so I suspect we're going to continue to see depletion of, of groundwater resources in, in the West. And, and uh, 
to the point where, where, where it gets critical. So what the long-term answer is, whether we look to, you know, building large-scale uh, desalination plants on, on the coast and, and uh, piping water everywhere, um, we, we may need to start looking at some pretty extreme solutions here. Uh, there are no good ones, uh, obviously. So, so, and, you know, we can debate back and forth on, on whether this is, uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, climate change or its natural climate change, I tend to believe there's there's probably a little bit of factor of both. I think it's probably more the fact that that uh, we're really seeing natural um, cycles. Uh, I, I did some some work back in college where I was actually looking at at uh, uh, natural precipitation cycles uh, over over really mega mega periods and and uh it's really interesting how you can see the patterns there's long-term patterns medium patterns short-term patterns and they all overprint on each other but the mere fact of the matter is is if you look at california for instance it's a desert and it's really for for really a couple hundred years or more it's been going through a historically wet period and we may be seeing that come to an end. So, so you take that and then you factor in that there may be some, some influence from, from an anthropogenic uh, climate change or, or global warming. And, and so you got a combination that's really creating uh, drier conditions than, than what people have been used to. And, and it's, you know, we, we talk about the COVID-19 new normal. Well, the water situation out west may be uh, the new normal once again, which which may actually be in a in a geological sense the old normal. So so we we see we we're seeing some of these uh, long term uh, cycles coming back to to haunt us. So so my opinion anyway, and and you can argue with me if you want, and and you may have some valid points. Uh, I'll I'll concede that is that that we have a combination of of natural weather cycles that, that are happening that that has some influence from from anthropogenic uh, uh, influences as well. So so that's uh, that's my opinion. I I really think the bigger factor is is probably the longer term natural cycles, and 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 so we're we're seeing kind of the uh, uh, you know what what you might call the triple witching point coming to, coming together and. You know, but the bottom line is, uh, it's it's not good news uh, for for uh, people that rely on water, and so much of California uh, is produces so much of our nation's agricultural products that that this is really, um, really a, a, a um, uh, an emergency situation when you look at it. We're already experiencing supply chain shortages. And if we're dealing with long-term shortages of agricultural products, uh, what happens then? Do we shift um, a lot of our, our ag production to, to the east? Um, the east probably is uh, typically wetter than, than, than the west. Uh, and, but the east is, is uh, if you look back through the drought monitor, you can see the dr east itself, and, and here in Tennessee, of course, um, we have had droughts in the past as well. Uh, they they don't tend to be as long lasting, but but they can impact things. So so it's um it's it's a it's a problem that that uh, that really needs to be addressed, um, and it's it probably needs to be addressed beyond political solutions. Everybody looks for political solutions, but my opinion on on uh, drought solutions as uh, being solved by political processes is not likely. Uh, most most politicians think in terms of, of election cycles, so you think in, in two-year cycles, and we really need long-range planning, and, and uh, you've probably heard me talk before about uh, my my, my pessimism about getting any long range planning out of politicians that are only worried about winning the next election. So at somebody at some point, somebody has to suck up and, and really look at, you know, 40, 50, 100 year projections on these things and do some some planning for that. And, and that's that's what needs to be done. And uh, that's what's sadly lacking in, in our planning process. You can't plan for for the next couple months and expect that to to uh, have long term uh, um, 
uh, effects. And, and generally with droughts, we, we kind of slip in and out of drought cycles. And as soon as the drought ends, the politicians move on to the next thing and, and they forget all about planning for the next one. And that's, which is exactly wrong. I mean, that's exactly 180 degrees from where you need to be. So um, let me just check comments here real quick, seeing if we got any coming in. Okay. All right, so let's move on to um, some other stories here. These are, I got some drought related stories here and and really we're seeing you know the effects of, of, of the drought as, as it drags on here. And it's affecting farmers the most. Uh, cities tend to get priority in, in their water supplies. Uh, and the farmers, uh, uh, you know, depending on, on who you are, some people say the farmers are, are taking too much water and they're irresponsible and, and others are saying the farmers aren't getting enough. So, so it's, it's, it's another one of those uh, political conversations that, that tend to rage on a little bit. But, but here we got this, uh, uh, this is a Jefferson Public Radio story here. Uh, that uh, uh, from Southern Oregon University, they're looking up at the Klamath Basin, which is the old, former old uh, Tule Lake uh, um, uh, area. Um, historically, Tule Lake was was a marshy area that was drained for uh, uh, back in the uh, um, um, uh, WPA days uh, for uh, um, uh, for to to. To, to create agricultural land and and it was uh it was an interesting project and and uh you know a process of the technology of the time but but we're seeing you know severe shortages up here so let's just kind of look at this story here a lot of potato farmers up here so um they're relying mainly on surface water uh right now they're um this is really focusing on ryan Cleaver. Uh, who's a third generation farmer up there. So so probably his family started with when they opened this up uh, after they, they drained the Thule Lake project, they actually opened it up for for land buys and, and brought people in. So it was, um, there's a, you can go back and look at some of the history. Uh, uh, there's some really interesting stories on where they were the initial farmers that came out of here um, uh, in the depression area and and really made a new life for themselves so it's so it's a fascinating this 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 area has a has a fascinating history and you know me being a history buff i i, I really like that and, and just some uh you go back and look at the old life magazine articles and there's just some stark black and white pictures in there of of uh of people back then that really knew how to how to work and and you know some of the sacrifices they made to come out and 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 really become become farmers so so fascinating stuff now we turn to today with three generations later and and we're looking at uh, people that, that are running shortage short of water in an area that was once really water rich so so it's a kind of a an interesting irony here uh, as as it were so anyway uh, so so this story really goes goes through here and and really discusses how, how they're being impacted. Um, their surface water deliveries are are being um, uh, uh, are are really being uh, impacted here. They're they're basically being shut off. So a lot of them are having to turn to to groundwater, which as we discussed is a finite resource. And and what we, what we look at is is the fact that. Okay, it really costs us uh, water, or uh, costs us money to, to pump, where where uh, the electricity for the pumps, uh, maintaining the wells and, and and that sort of thing. So so there are there is more cost to, to pumping water, but at least they they have it. But the problem is is once again, as we know, groundwater is a is a finite resource. So so we're looking at depleting depleting that resource to kind of keep things going. So so they're really trying to strike a balance. Uh, there's also a little bit of a cooperative uh, effort here between the different farmers, the Klamath Valley Water Users Association, uh, the different irrigation districts out there. <clears throat> Some people are curtailing their own production to help their neighbors that might not have as much water. So so it's. Um, so, so they are helping each other out, but as, as the drought drags on here, uh, there's going to be more impacts. I would expect these, these guys would not get 
uh, much in the way of surface water next year either. So, um, so uh, there's there's only a few irrigation districts up there that have wells. Tule Lake uh, Irrigation District is is one of those, and and uh, um, but. You know the wells don't go everywhere. They're not piped everywhere, so so there's limited reach for for that water resource as well. So, um, so some of these people are are not even breaking even. They don't expect to break even this year, and and of course they got mortgages on the farm and the house, and and um, so it's so it's certainly impacting the, these people as well. So. Um, um, these are you know, a lot of potato farmers up here, and and uh, <clears throat> and so you know impact from from the the wildfires up there, the the smoke and and the COVID nineteen pandemic, you know. So these are impacting <clears throat> farming is is a marginal business as it is for a family farmer, which is why you're seeing more and more of these big corporate farms out there. It's tough to make a living. You have a few bad years. <clears throat> and you're out of business so so it's really these people are, are incredibly resourceful people but they are draining their resources so um here's another guy here dan chin uh grain alfalfa and potatoes um alfalfa tends to be a little bit more water intensive but if you're going to raise cattle then uh you know to, to supply the cattle then alfalfa is, is really something you need. Uh, grass hay doesn't doesn't cut it. Is not protein intensive as alfalfa is. Uh, potatoes, not not really too water intensive. Grain can, can be dry land farmed. Uh, I don't know if that's what they're doing up here, but but uh, uh, so grain is not quite as water intensive. Uh, but but Chin is saying he's farming about forty percent of the acreage that he'd normally plant. So. So think about that multiplying to the U.S. food supply. If if we're seeing areas that are under 50 percent of the food production that they once have, and now we're seeing imports being curtailed and supply chain shortages, and and the impacts of of the COVID-19 pandemic with transportation of these products, um, shortage of workers out there. And now we're seeing shortages showing up uh, at on the grocery store shelves, and and we're also ex hearing news that we're expecting the, the the supply chain shortages and the shortages at the grocery stores to uh, to continue or to even get worse. So so um, that's that's really what we're facing here. So that's what this translates to. So you may say, okay, this is just this one guy, and and he's down sixty percent on on the number of crops he has and 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 the the uh the revenue he can make but we we really want to translate that to how that affects the the, the country as a whole and and so you start to look at it from the big picture perspective and what an outsized um uh, percentage of of the nation's uh, vegetables and and crops are produced in california then you really start to see the severity of, of this situation so, uh, so once again, that this this is a pretty long and, and interesting article. Um, they all recognize that groundwater is not the long term answer for them, and and that's that's really what it comes down to. But 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 uh, with with no precipitation and the reservoirs uh, depleted, uh, a lot of these reservoirs are are way way low. So so we're seeing uh, just no water to to go around it in the reservoirs. So. <clears throat> Um, so we're probably going to see the, the uncertainty of farming out there, especially for these, uh, uh, family farms is, is probably uncertain. We're going to see a lot of these people going out of business in the next few years. They're probably going to sell out, sell out to the big corporate farms that are going to be able to swing deals for, for the water and stuff. And to our, more of our detriment, uh, um, we're going to be seeing more, more, uh, um, you know, GMO crops and, and those types of things that, that some people have problems with being grown. Um, you know, maybe the answer is more drought resistant crops or growing crops that are less water dependent. Uh, we know down in the Central Valley, they tend to grow a lot of almonds and, and some things like that, that, that are a little more water intensive. We may see less of that. Um, so 
uh, lower profit, but uh, uh, crops that, that that require less water. So, um, uh, you know, more more uh, efficiency in irrigation, but but you still have to supply. There still has to be some water coming out there. So so uh, drip irrigation and more efficient irrigation is certainly going to be helpful, but but it's going to be something that that really um, <clears throat> that 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 you still got to have some water going going to the crop so you just get it there as efficiently as possible so if there's no water then then the most efficient irrigation system in the world is not going to do you much good so um uh you know here he's saying that uh 20 percent less on on even the grain harvest that's just not quite as water intensive now there is some uh, uh, some federal funding that's out there, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the EPA has actually just started a program, uh, Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Department of uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture has drought relief funds through their Equag program. So so there is uh, drought relief programs, but but ultimately it's there has to be the water there in order to, for these uh, programs to be effective. So so you can. You, you can get some drought relief, but in the long run, the, the future still is still is uncertain, even with some drought relief. So um, it's, you know, like uh, like this guy here says, Scotty Fenton, uh, federal funding is extra money to help with expenses, but he doesn't think it's going to be game changing because ultimately it comes down to how much water there is. So so in the end, they're praying for rain, you know, and that that's about all you can do at this point is 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 get on your knees and, and, and pray hard because it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's what, what they need is, is more precipitation is really what it comes down to. So um, our next story here is, is a, a, a little flip of that is, is um, this also interestingly is enough, enough is a, another NPR story or a public radio story. So, so they're really looking at, at doing satellite studies of, of, uh, um, the secrets of water guzzling farms, and, and I think most most farmers would tell you that they're that they're a lot more efficient than they used to, so they're not uh, guzzling water. But but uh, we'll take it for for what it's worth here, and 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 go with the flow. So um, so, but this this type of thing, you know, the caveat here is this type of thing is really important to understand. Uh, basin wide use of, of water and and this is specific to California but but you can take it anywhere where you have groundwater basins you can go to the Midwest and and really look at this type of thing too because studying and understanding how water is being used and how best uh, to you know where uh, for instance if you're doing uh, uh, aquifer storage and recovery programs or, or groundwater recharge programs uh, from from the surface then this can tell you where where those programs Programs might might be most useful if you understand where how the water is is actually being used and and anytime you have better data on understanding the inputs and outputs of of the of the, of the groundwater basin what people call the water balance it, it helps you to understand how that water is being used and how you can better manage that water. I think ultimately we're going to have a have a meter on on every well and in in uh, most states but but probably california is going to be one of the first places to do that uh but but any state that's subject to, to drought on a continual basis or a, or a regular basis is probably going to see uh metered water on on even on ag wells and you're going to get an allocation and it's going to be based on on what's going on in that part of the basin and and that's that's really probably one of the long-term management solutions i don't think uh the the California Sustainable Groundwater Mount Water, uh, Management Act actually specifically addresses that, but some of the plans on the basins, I, I know, do touch on some of that. And, but I expect that's probably going to be one of the long-term things we, we see, especially in California. And I think it'll probably spread out to, to places like Nevada and Arizona as well, where, where we have specific groundwater basins that we can actually manage. So... Um, so anyway, um, really based on it, uh, doing the water balance for for a, a groundwater basin is a complex process. You need to understand how much water is coming in and how much water is going in out. 
And that seems like a relatively simple equation, but when you start calculating those numbers with any degree of accuracy, it becomes incredibly con uh, convoluted and complex. And, you know, understanding how much water is, is, is going out. Um, generally, water that's going in is going to be precipitation, but, but even then you have to understand how much water that's precipitation is actually making it to the groundwater. And so there's going to be a certain amount that's going to that you're, that you're going to lose to evapotranspiration or, or evaporation. And, and so and that's going to vary by region. And so so you start to dive into the into the little details and and drill down and it becomes a complex process. So so this study is really part of part of trying to get uh, get at the inputs and outputs so we can better manage the uh, the, the water in, in our in the groundwater basins. So land IQ is is uh, what what this program is. They're using satellite photography to collect data on a field by field water use basis, uh, but but it's it's uh, for now it's easier and cheaper than than getting water meters installed on every well in the district, and and to that I would already say that there's there's some areas where we're actually doing uh, groundwater level measurements anyway. Uh, where where they're tying together, they got these Wi-Fi networks, and they're they're measuring water levels in in wells, and and we're seeing more and more of this going on, so they can at least measure water levels. Uh, water usage uh, is is just a step above that, actually. So. Um, so anyway, what they do is they figure out which crops are growing in what fields. Uh, they uh, they take the satellite images. They create some overlays, uh, and they're using uh, uh, the 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 bandwidth of, of the of the satellite. You can break out the different color bandwidths and and start to. Uh, uh, do do a little bit of analysis there, and so they produce a fingerprint of, of each crop. So so they're actually able to figure out what walnuts and and alfalfa and tomatoes and and everything looks like based on on developing a fingerprint for for those crops in the field. So they can take the satellite photography and now figure out that uh, you know what what's growing where and kind of expand that out. So. And now they can tie that back to to water usage. Um, so, and he says, you know, really they're they're getting a, a mistaken identity about four percent of the time. I would say that's pretty darn good for for an automated technique. So, um, uh, but um, so in the long run, knowing what crops you have will tell you how much water they're demanding. So. So an almond tree is going to demand a lot of water. Grain, not so much. And there's <clears throat> everything in between. So um, <clears throat> so what they say here, every each crop at a particular point in its life cycle takes up a predictable amount of water and releases it through its leaves, depending on uh, evapotranspiration then, uh, depending on local weather conditions. And so... Now they know they tie back to local weather conditions and, and weather monitoring stations, and they know what the wind speed, heat, humidity, and they can translate all that so they can, uh, so they can understand what the evapotranspiration rates are. And now you can start to look and see how you can really develop some pretty reliable data to predict the water use in, in, in these areas. And that goes back. Now we can... It's, it's one step then to going back to, to managing uh, the groundwater in the basin to understanding what are our outflows now? Uh, what are we being used? How much um, annual crops are out there? Olives and alfalfa and, and almonds are, are using up so much water. And, and so maybe we need to say, okay, we need to figure out a way to cut back on water use in this area because we're depleting the water faster than, than it's coming in. And it becomes a, uh, a little more scientific way of, of managing the water uh, rather than by, by guess and by gully. So, so anyway, this is, uh, this is an interesting article. I'm all for, for using science and, and satellite photography to, to, really, uh, to, to really study these things and understand our water usage so we can, we can manage things better. Like it or not, the days of unrestricted water use are, are over. And we're going to have to figure out a way to properly manage things in, in, a, in, a, in a fair way to, to, to manage these things.
Okay, so our next story is is uh, is innovative use of, of uh, wastewater uh, to, to irrigate vineyards. So a lot of and, and we're seeing we've seen this trend coming up for for a number of years where a lot of Napa Valley wineries are actually taking their uh, it takes a lot, lot of water to process the grapes and, and produce wine. And so they produce wastewater. So what they're doing now is they're reprocessing this wastewater on site and, and using that to irrigate their, their vineyards. It's an innovative process. And um, uh, so it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity not to waste water. It's, it's to recycle that water. So they're talking here that, that uh, the rough estimate uh, of making wine requires a six to one ratio of, of water. So you're producing um, six gallons of, of uh, wastewater for every gallon of, of uh, wine you produce. So, so that's a lot of wasted water. And so I applaud these guys for really looking at, at getting back and, and, uh, and using this wastewater, especially during drought conditions. But, but this could be a way of life. And, and really, uh, once again, if you can use the wastewater to irrigate, that's less groundwater you need to use. And we can protect and, and uh, uh, maintain our, our groundwater. So um, next story here is, uh, you know, we're, we're moving to Arizona. And this is my offending um, uh, video that keeps playing here. So, so my apologies on that. But... Uh, uh, Arizona, of course, if, if we, uh, if you remember the drought map we showed her a little earlier, <laughs> Arizona is certainly affected by, by the drought as well. And, and they're really looking at the fact that La Nina could, could make their, their bad drought worse. Um, they're pro they're, they're being affected by the same things as, as Southern California is really what it boils down to. And, and so, so that's that's really what it comes down to is is they're not going to see much precipitation this this winter, and uh, the lakes, the dams, the reservoirs, just like in California, uh, they're they're dry. Uh, Lake Mead is uh, um, is down so low. Uh, uh, that's up near Las Vegas. So so Nevada, of course, is affected by this as well. Uh, Lake Mead is down so low that their normal water intakes are are above the water now. They've actually had to extend the intakes down deeper uh, and into the lake so they can actually get adequate water. So so they did some emergency uh, additions to that uh, a little bit earlier this year. Uh, lake Powell, uh, which is uh, northern Arizona, um, they they. Uh, um, they have not been able to run their power plant in two years because of low water. So, so a lot. Of, so, so obviously the drought is affecting electricity production as as well. So, so that's another factor. So, so Arizona being affected as well. We're seeing Nevada affected also. So, so that whole three state southwestern region is is definitely being affected. Um, and hey, uh, just just a, a little bit of other news here, uh, to looking at the, the human interest side. And I post this up because I'm a beekeeper myself, is is the drought even affects our, our honeybees. And and uh, here we have the oldest beekeeper in Los Angeles explaining how the, the drought affects bees. And, and this is just was an interesting uh, story that, that caught my eye. Um, He's 97 years old. He's still a beekeeper. So, uh, so awesome story here. Um, but uh, he's really saying here, and 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 I won't dwell on this too long. But uh, um, he's got a 300-year tradition of beekeeping in his family. So, so that's pretty awesome. But, but, uh, but what he's really saying is is what uh, is the the, in urban areas where people water their lawns and that type of thing is is the bees aren't really being affected, but it's it's the wild bees, the feral bees out there that, that are being affected. They don't have water sources. And as a beekeeper, I know I got to uh, water my bees. I, I put water sources out there for, for my bees because uh, they, they need water. Uh, and, and when you think about that, that's really true. But most people don't think about bees drinking water, but but they certainly do. So so this is just another little little um, um, 
sidelight on on the effects of of the drought. So, so it's uh, uh but but it's an interesting human interest story too. But but uh, bees are already under stress in this country. Uh, we know as beekeepers that uh, we lose colonies all the time, and and it's it's uh, it's tough uh, keeping them going. And this is just one more stress on 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 the bees. And we need bees as pollinators, especially these big corporate farms that uh, up in the Central Valley, um, they, uh, they bring in bees to, to pollinate during certain times of the year. And if they don't have bees, you're not getting things pollinated. Once again, food shortages. So, so it all ties together. It, it really does. It all ties back to, to the water. The water is the key. Okay, moving on. Uh, Department of Water Resources. Um, uh just checking comments here real quick um department of water resources in california is uh they just awarded another 28 million in small community drought relief funding uh the um they have a program out there that that funds uh, uh, a lot of little projects for, for smaller, smaller communities. Uh, they're mainly focused on disadvantaged communities where you're below the medium income level in the state. Uh, we can see the, uh, the, the projects they, they funded here. So, so they kind of vary, but, uh, mainly in the central part of the state. Uh, and so there are, um, <clears throat> there are, uh, we've seen, you know, uh, Canocti County, uh, uh, Madero Ranchos, uh, City of Ukiah, um, uh, City of Orleans, City of Orange Cove, uh, uh, the uh, Kashia Band of Pomo Indians, uh, who I've worked with in the past, uh, Rolling Hills Mutual Water Company, uh, Interconnects. So, so there's a lot of lot of. Uh, uh, opportunities there, uh, aging pipelines, infrastructure, uh, deepening wells, it's uh, interconnections is, is really what this, this program is for. Here is the, uh, um, here's the page where you can actually apply for that if, if you want, or this explains it a little bit more. Uh, really what they're saying is, is uh, they're, they're small communities with what they're looking for. Uh, this is under drought emergency proclamations by the governor and are not served by an urban water supply. So um, it's, it's uh, and um, uh, so there's some other requirements here they're, they're looking at to what, what, what you can apply, what you can use it for. And the application process is, is uh, explained right here. So, so I throw that out there for any small communities that, that may uh, be listening to this or, or uh, listen to the recording is this is certainly an opportunity there as well. So, uh, so let's move on a little bit. Um, uh, the EPA, of course, is, is moving to, uh, to uh, rein in the, the, uh, the, the, the scourge of uh, PFAS uh, that we're seeing everywhere. Uh, they, they, um, they're basically putting more pressure on, and, and if you watch the show, you know that uh, the EPA has also added PFAS to their list that, that they're going to regulate in, in uh, the long, laborious process of establishing MCLs and, and whatnot has, has started as they've, they've put that on their list. So toxicological studies and, and, uh, and well, it'll basically result in, in an enforceable MCL, but you're not going to see that for, for another five years, probably. Uh, so in the meantime, we need to move on this because these things keep showing up everywhere. And so one of the things they're looking at doing is requiring chemical manufacturers to test for PFOS because it shows up in, in everything. It's, it's out there. And public will report the amount of, of uh, PFOS that's in household items, tape, nonstick pans, stain resistant furniture, uh, you name it, where, where it's showing up. Um, they call it the for, forever chemicals, which I, I think is is a clever marketing <laughs> on the environmental side. But um, but uh, the fact is they don't break down real well in the in the environment. Natural attenuation, as we understand right now, is not a huge factor in, in breaking these things down. I would say that I would say that we'll probably find out eventually that they do break down under certain conditions, but these are are pretty darn stable in, in the environment. 
uh, they also do not uh, attenuate from, from the standpoint of adhering to clay particles. Uh, so you don't have any adsorption going on. So they just tend, these plumes tend to be, uh, PFOS plumes tend to be pretty darn big. So, so they, la they're, they last, they're persistent, and they don't, uh, they don't absorb onto clay particles like a lot of contaminants do. So they're not, uh, 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 so they're polar and, they, they they just spread so so they are, they really are a problem and we know that uh, uh, that that they do that there's a lot of health problems associated with uh, with these things we don't know what what the toxicological uh, results really are because because they're still studying those and those are long term studies but but we we are seeing steps uh, by both the US EPA and a lot of states to, to regulate these things and re really try to get their their arm around it some people are frustrated at the pace of this but but really uh, you have to know how to regulate it and and uh, what the effects even are uh, and and really you know what what this article is getting at is is what, what these things are in, what are the sources? We, we don't even totally understand that right now. I mean, uh, we're seeing PFAS showing up in, in a lot of stuff. And, and by some estimations out there that, that uh, most, most people in the United States have some level of detectable PFAS in, in, in their bloodstream. So, so we know we're picking it up uh, from, from all over the place. So, so it really is, is pretty persistent. And, and so we're going to see a lot more regulatory efforts uh, uh, directed at, at PFOS. It's going to keep showing up in the news. And I got, got just a few articles here. Just this is the kind of typical stuff you, you get out there is, uh, you know, this is Lansing, Michigan, for instance. Uh, it's, it's showing up here. This is just a typical article. You can go to the, to the water news every day of the week and, and see articles like this popping up is, is, is PFOS, PFOS, PFOS. It's all over the news. Um, different states are, are looking at different, different ways. Uh, Iowa to start testing uh, water for, for forever chemicals or the PFOS. And, and so we're seeing a lot of this too as, as states move to, to uh, uh, at least understand the extent of the problem and how they can deal with it. So, so that, that's important. Um, you know, more, more articles out there on, on this, uh, um, uh, this is really covering kind of the same ground that New York Times article mentioned uh, as well. So, and finally, uh, today I'm going to wrap up with uh, this is this is a little esoteric, but uh, and and diving into the scientific end of things. But but I thought I'd post this up because it's some interesting news because um, I work in in the Mojave Desert area of California uh, a bit, and and one of the contaminants we run into is is uh, is boron. Uh, and and boron is notoriously hard to to treat uh, chemically. It's it, or, or uh, in a in a water treatment plant, it it actually is one of those things that, that does does not respond well to things like reverse osmosis. So um, it's uh, it's not uh, reverse osmosis, which cap captures most things that that uh, other treatment techniques don't actually is is not a good technique for 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 boron so so there's some studies being done here um, that where they've they've uh, made some progress looking at electrochemical removal of these different ions uh, uh, ampheric uh, ions uh, such as boron ammonia phosphates that, that are difficult to treat otherwise so they're making some some progress on on this here so I just mentioned this because it's it is it does show up. Uh, the Mojave Desert, of course, has a lot of evaporite deposits that, that have boron in them, but but ammonia is a fairly common contaminant as as well, and phosphate also in in, in certain areas as well. But uh, I brought this caught my eye because because we're 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 uh, we deal with some boron issues from from time to time, so. Um, so this is kind of this is uh, the the abstract here, and and uh, it just kind of goes through the process, and and uh, and really looks at here. It it gets into uh, some pretty uh, pretty heavy duty scientific uh, um, 
uh, uh, discussion, but but really, it's it's a, what they, what they're doing is they're comparing it to reverse osmosis, and and basically they're saying for to increase boron removal with reverse osmosis, they basically have to do multiple passes of desalinated water multiple times through an RO membrane, which is expensive and not very cost effective, obviously. So. Um, and uh, so there's all kinds of things they need to do to get rid of the uh, the boron in an RO system. So this this discusses that here and and dives into detail that. So um, uh, so that what they're really talking about here is capacitive deionization or CDI technology, and it's actually showing some promise here. So I won't dive into all the uh, scientific details because that's probably not what you're looking for here. But but this article is is here. Um, and it and it grows into some pretty good detail, but the fact is CDI is showing some promise for for some of these things that are expensive and difficult to remove during uh, during PFOS uh, using a uh, um, uh, back to the PFOS uh, uh, for boron, ammonia, phosphate, some of those types of things that that are uh, that are notoriously difficult to get rid of using uh, uh, reverse osmosis. CDI technology is showing showing some. Uh, uh, some some potential there. So so that's what I have for you today. Uh, we'll be back next week, and let me uh, close out here saying uh, thanks for watching this. We appreciate the support, whether you're watching this uh, live or or on the recording. We appreciate you as as the audience continues to grow here. Um, let me just wrap up by saying we we have several means that we get out there. We live stream into our YouTube channel, which is the Groundwater Guy channel. Um, you can find that here. It's got a long uh, a long cryptic uh, URL, but but you can just find us by looking for the Groundwater Guy channel. Uh, we're on Facebook as well. Uh, kind of stream into there just so we can have a place to to put the recordings. Uh, don't get much traction there on, on Facebook, but, uh, but it's there if, if, if you want to use Facebook, if that's your thing, then, then, then we're there as well. We're trying to be a lot of different places. Um, if you want to be a guest on Groundwater Talk Live, we love to talk to people about why, uh, groundwater related issues or water related issues in general. So you can book a slot uh, for we're on every Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Central time. And you're more than welcome to book a slot and come on and join us. There's our link for that. So you can just get on there and, and book a slot and, and we'll come up with a, a list of questions we can we can talk about and topics and, and go over. And we've had some interesting guests. If you followed the program, if you uh, if you're new, then go back and look at uh, they're up on our YouTube channel, all the past recordings and and uh, you might find some interesting information there. Um, also on LinkedIn, um, you can you can find me on LinkedIn. We stream live into LinkedIn. Also, there's my profile. You can find me there, and uh, so so I'd be happy to talk to you. My email is is there on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm happy to chat with you about uh, water related topics or whatever issues you might be having. We we deal with uh, water groundwater related and well well specific issues and and so i'm happy to talk with you about that as, as well so and also if um you know thanks for any comments if you're watching this on the recording please post any comments below we appreciate the comments even if stop in to say hi all the comments increase the distribution so so please post a comment even if say hi or you watched it or or uh you know uh uh, say something cryptic or, <laughs> you know, whatever, share a joke. I, I don't care. <laughs> you know, no, it's, it's, uh, I, I appreciate any and all comments. I respond to the comments and, and we'll definitely, uh, get back with you on, on that. And we appreciate it. And, and, uh, on LinkedIn, especially comments and, and shares really, really help, uh, uh, help the distribution here and helps expose us to, to new people. So I appreciate that. So with that, um, we are done today. We will look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week. And I am the Groundwater Guy, signing off.